Hello and welcome to Arcadia University's histology course uh, series of lectures on the respiratory system. In this lecture we're going to take a look at the conducting portion of the respiratory system. Now the conducting portion and basically the, the respiratory system proper is going to start out with the nasal cavity. Uh, so that's going to be the beginning of the respiratory passageway and so if we take a look at this uh, what we're going to see is going to be an opening uh, to the respiratory tract. It's going to be lined by an olfactory mucosa, uh, which is going to be lining the roof of the nasal cavity. And this is going to be a little bit different than the respiratory lining over most of the rest of the respiratory tract. We take a look at the olfactory mucosa. Uh, we see that it's going to be thicker than uh, the other areas of that uh, respiratory epithelium. We'll get the pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelia. And what's important to recognize is that in the olfactory uh, mucosa, we're going to lack those goblet cells. So we're not going to have the goblet cells going to be present. It's just going to be the, the pseudostratified columnar epithelia. Underlying um, the olfactory mucosa is going to be Bowman's glands. Bowman's glands are going to be serosecreting glands. So they're going to be essentially secreting a proteinaceous uh, substance which is going to serve as a solvent for odors. And so basically what's going to happen is it's going to coat the lining, it's going to be a solvent, and essentially uh, as particles are going to be uh, inhaled, breathed in, uh, some of those particles are going to become dissolved within uh, the secretions of the Bowman's glands. And by being dissolved, they're going to be able to diffuse uh, along the epithelial lining and then essentially trigger uh, sensory cells and allow them uh, essentially the smells to be detected. So if we take a look at the cells within the olfactory mucosa that are responsible for smell reception, uh, they're essentially going to be bipolar uh, sensory neurons. And so they're going to be olfactory uh, receptor cells. And so in essence, what they're going to do is be able to respond to the specific shapes of molecules that are present within um, the, the secretions of the Bowman's glands. And so it needs to be dissolved, it needs to be able to get in and then interact uh, with these olfactory receptor cells. There are going to be some syntactular cells, which are going to be support cells that are going to be surrounding, supporting the receptor cells, uh, as well as some basal cells. Uh, the basal cells, the stem cells, like we talked about in the previous lecture, that can divide and produce new cells uh, as they're needed for the epithelial lining. We move back. Uh, from the nasal cavity down into uh, the respiratory passageway. We're going to get to the pharynx. Uh, within the nasal pharynx, uh, essentially the back of the, the nasal cavity, uh, so we're going to line by the respiratory epithelium. We're going to have uh, pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelia with goblet cells now at this point. And it's going to be a location uh, where the tonsils are going to start to appear. The oral pharynx, uh, this is the back of the oral cavity, uh, essentially going to be a stratified squamous, non-keratinized, or minimally keratinized epithelium. Uh, again, stratified squamous, uh, minimally keratinized. Uh, it's going to be an epithelium that is uh, essentially resistant to abrasion. And so that's important, again, because what we're looking at in the oropharynx is a region that's shared between the digestive system and the respiratory system. And so... Um, pseudostratified columnar epithelia or some of the other epithelia we're going to see within the respiratory system are going to be vulnerable to damage uh, by food particles that are being chewed and swallowed. And so we need the stratified squamous epithelia to be resistant, at least in the area where we're likely to see uh, large kind of clumps of food material kind of moving across the epithelial lining. We go down into the larynx. Uh, again, the larynx is an irregular tube between the pharynx and the trachea. Uh, we're seeing the, uh, still seeing the, uh, the epithelial lining as that minimally keratinized stratified squamous. We're going to start to see the, the structure of uh, the respiratory tract developing. It's going to be framed by both hyaline and elastic cartilage. And it's going to be this location where you'd have both the false and the true vocal cords, uh, vocal folds being present. Uh, the false vocal uh, cord is going to be superior to the true vocal cord. Uh, it's going to be lined by a pseudostratified columnar epithelia. And then underlying that is going to be a lot of serum mucous glands. 
and then the true vocal fold uh, is going to be lined by a stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, and then underlying that, we're going to have some striated muscle, which is going to be the vocalis muscles. So you can regulate uh, your vocal cords uh, by, by contracting those muscles. You're also going to have the vocal ligament, which is a dense regular connective tissue um, that's going to be present there to help with the, the generation of sound. Um, and then unlike the false vocal cords, we're not going to have any of those submucosal glandular tissues under the true uh, vocal fold. Now, as we get down into uh, the trachea itself, uh, such as extending from the larynx down through the trachea into the primary uh, bronchi, what we're going to see is going to be an epithelium, which is going to be lined by a pseudostratified columnar uh, epithelium. Uh, the classic example for a respiratory epithelium that we've, we've seen previ previously. Lots of goblet cells and lots of cilia to propel the, the mucus that's being produced by the goblet cells. Within the trachea, uh, the underlying the pseudostratified columnar epithelia, we're going to have mixed seromucous glands, so lots of glands, uh, glandular cells that are going to be present there to contribute to uh, uh, the modification, the secretions for the modification of the air as it's passing through the trachea. Now, the trachea is going to be supported by a C-shaped hyaline cartilaginous ring, which is going to be uh, surrounding and supporting it. A complete C uh, as we're through the trachea. The opening of the C is, is going to face dorsally, it's going to face towards the esophagus, and the opening is going to be filled with smooth muscle to regulate uh, it a little bit, uh, as well as fibroelastic tissue and glandular tissues. As we branch off of the trachea, we're essentially going to branch either to the left or right, you know, the, the left main stem branch bronchi or the right main stem bronchi, but basically we're going to bifurcate from the trachea and then go into each of the, uh, the lobes of the lung, each of the, the main clusters of the lung, it's the left lung and right lung. And at this point that nice C-shaped cartilaginous structure is going to start to become less uh, apparent. It's essentially going to be within the bronchi supported by incomplete or irregular cartilaginous rings or plates. So we're still going to have a lot of cartilage, which is going to be present performing the structure of the wall, but it's not going to be a complete C-shaped structure like we saw within the trachea. Still lined by a respiratory epithelia with uh, many goblet cells going to be present uh, within the bronchus. We get down into the bronchioles, again into the finer branches uh, within the respiratory tract. Uh, we take a look at the epithelial lining. Uh, instead of a pseudostratified columnar epithelia, we're going to get simple columnar. Uh, still going to be ciliated, uh, but we're not going to have goblet cells. Again, we want to maintain the cilia deeper within the lungs than when we're producing the, the goblets, um, sorry, producing the mucus cells, mucus by the goblet cells, because we want to have the ability of the cilia to continue to propel the mucus back towards the opening of the respiratory tract, uh, basically back towards the oral cavity where it can either be expelled or swallowed. We take a look at the wall structure. Uh, by the time we get down into the bronchioles, there's going to be no cartilage and no submucosal glands. So the wall structure itself is going to be smooth muscle. Uh, lots of elastic fibers allowing for it to expand and recoil without damage. But the smooth muscle is going to be important because it allows us then to regulate airflow uh, within the lungs. We get down deeper within it, we're going to go from the bronchioles and the terminal bronchioles. Uh, we're going to see clara cells as the predominant uh, cells lining uh, the epithelium at this point. They're going to be smaller, they're going to be unciliated, and as we said previously, they're going to be important for secreting proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. So they're essentially putting uh, a secretion onto the surface of uh, the bronchioles onto the surface of the air passageway uh, to minimize surface tension. And so they're going to have a, a function very similar to surfactant. And they're also going to protect the bronchiolar lining. Still going to be some ciliated cells. There's going to be a little bit taller cells that so gives it kind of an up and down appearance uh, within the terminal bronchioles. And normally you're not going to see goblet cells. In some disease states uh, you're going to see goblet cells down in these deeper regions because there's still particulate matter getting down there and irritating uh, these, these cells. 
So that's going to finish up our discussion of the conducting portion of the respiratory tract. Uh, come back for part three and we're going to start to take a look at the uh, actual respiratory or exchange portion uh, of the respiratory tract. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.